Amen. Thanks, worship team. And thanks, uh, John and Jacob. That was, that's fun. That's a special announcement. So that's an exciting uh, new chapter for our church. So we have a full-time dedicated SALT director. I've been the SALT director this past year, but it, admittedly, it's just been kind of split double duty. And our, our SALT company ministry deserves one person whose whole heart and life is just focused on that. So Jacob, we're excited, brother. It's going to be fun to do ministry with you and just to see what God does with, with our salt company here. So uh, welcome to Veritas Church here in Dubuque. Uh, my name's Travis. I'm one of the pastors here at Veritas and excited to keep going through the book of Amos. So we're in Amos chapter 5 today. You can go ahead and get your Bibles out. You can flip there. We're going to go through uh, chapter 5 in the book of Amos this morning. And we're going to learn, you're, you're going to learn a little bit more about God this morning. Uh, doesn't that sound like a good thing? When I think about this uh, concept, it's like, yeah, of course, that sounds like a good thing. But here, this J.I. Packer quote, I think will help us kind of get our hearts and our minds prepared to, to learn more about God in a way that he says it humbles our mind. So, so tune into this quote here. This is from uh, J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God. He says, there is something exceedingly improving to the mind in a contemplation of the divinity. It is a subject so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. No subject of contemplation will tend more to humble the mind than thoughts of God. So are we ready to think about God this morning and humble our minds? And as we try to understand God more this morning, what we're going to think about is fire. We're going to think about this metaphor of God as a fire. And you know some of the stories in the Bible that include fire. Like there's the burning bush, right? It says in Exodus 3.2, an angel of the Lord appeared to, to Moses in a flame and, and a fire within a bush. And as Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire but was not consumed. So the bush was on fire but not being consumed. We'll contrast that with Deuteronomy 4.24. 4, the Lord your God is a consuming fire. So God is, is a fire that is consuming. Well, the angel of the Lord appeared in a bush that was on fire but not being consumed. So there's something here going on with, with this fire and, and whether or not it consumes things. Back in our text, verse 6, before we go all the way through it, just look at verse 6. This is kind of a keynote of this whole text. Seek the Lord and live or he will spread like fire. It's kind of a haunting sentence, isn't it? Seek the Lord and live, or he will spread like fire. So here's, here's what's happening in this whole chapter today. Is we're looking at what happens when the fire spreads through the people. Seek the Lord and live, or he will spread like fire. Well, what happens when the fire spreads? It's going to be, it's going to do three things. It's going to be revealing Okay, it's going to reveal things that are there. It's going to have an element of finality to it. And it's going to bring out cosmic justice. So it's going to be revealing. It's going to have an element of finality and cosmic justice. Let's start out with just reading the whole chapter, Amos chapter 5. Listen to this message that I am singing for you. A lament house of Israel. Okay, so this whole thing is a lament. This is set to a song that would have been known by the Israelites, like a hymn, but it's crazy. Amos changes some of the lyrics, turns like kind of a joyful song into a lament song. Just an interesting fact about it to have in the back of your mind as you read this. Okay, so this is like lyrics of a song written out. Okay, here's the lament, house of Israel, verse two. She has fallen. Virgin Israel will never rise again she lies abandoned on her land with no one to raise her up. For the Lord God says, the city that marches out a thousand strong will only have a hundred left. And the one that marches out a hundred strong will only have ten left. You see, there's a winnowing effect. For the Lord says to the house of Israel, seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel or go to Gilgal or journey to Beersheba. Remember, John talked about these last week. These are these houses of false worship of like idol worship. Do not seek those houses. Don't go to Bethel. It will, Bethel will come to nothing. 
Verse 6, seek the Lord and live, or he will spread like fire throughout the house of Joseph. It will consume everything with no one at Bethel to extinguish it. Those who turn justice to wormwood also throw righteousness to the ground. They they invert justice, right? Verse 8, the one who made the Pleiades and Orion, these constellations in the sky, the one who made the Pleiades and Orion, who turns darkness into dawn and darkens day into night, who summons the water out of the sea and pours it over the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. He brings destruction on the strong and it falls on the fortress. They, back in verse 7, those who invert justice, right? They hate the one who convicts the guilty at the city gate. They despise the one who speaks with integrity. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and exact a grain tax from him, you will never live in the houses of cut stone you have built. You will never drink wine from the lush vineyards you have planted. For I know your crimes are many, your sins innumerable. They oppress the righteous, take a bribe, and deprive the poor of justice at the city gates. Therefore, those who have insight will keep silent at such a time, for the days are evil. Pursue good and not evil, so that you may live, right? Remember, seek the Lord and live. Pursue good and not evil, so that you may live. And the Lord, the God of armies, will be with you as you have claimed. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice in the city gate. Instead of perverting justice, right? Establish justice in the city gate. Perhaps the Lord, the God of armies, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, the Lord, the God of armies, the Lord says, there will be wailing in the public squares. There will be, there, they will cry out in anguish in all the streets. The farmer will be called on to mourn. The professional mourners to wail. There will be wailing in all the vineyards. For I will pass among you. Right? The fire. I will pass among you. The Lord has spoken. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. What will the day of the Lord be for you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be like a man who flees from a lion. Only to have a bear confront him. Who goes home and rests his hand against the wall. Only to have a snake come and bite him. Won't the day of the Lord be darkness rather than light? Even gloom? without any brightness in it? Remember the bad sacrifices at Gilgal, Beersheba. I hate, I despise your feasts. I can't stand your, the stench of your solemn assemblies. Even if you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will have no regard for your fellowship offerings of fattened cattle. Take away the noise of your songs, your, your music. I will not listen to your music of your harps. But... Let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. House of Israel, was it sacrifices and grain offerings that you presented to me during the 40 years in the wilderness? But you've taken up Sakuth, your king, and Kaiwan, your star god. These are just false gods. Images you have made for yourselves. So I will send you into exile beyond Damascus. The Lord, the God of armies, is his name. He has spoken. Well, that's God's word for us this morning. It's a, a, a big story as we continue in this story of Amos, and there's a lot to unpack here. And like I said, the way that I'm framing this for us this morning to just take this in to contemplate God, what is it like when God passes among the people? What is it like when the fire passes among the people? And we see those three things, right? It's revealing It has a level of finality, and it brings cosmic justice. So the first one is revealing. What do I mean by that? When the fire passes through, the people start to actually see. They start to actually see things rightly. So God's actually going to correct how they see four things in this whole section here. right? Verse 4 all the way kind of through verse 17. He's correcting things they see. So he's going to correct their understanding of repentance. He's going to reveal what repentance actually is. He's going to reveal what strength actually is. He's going to reveal what justice actually is. And he's going to reveal good and evil. So verse 4 through 7, what's going on here? The Lord says to the house of Israel, seek me and live. Don't seek Bethel. Don't seek Gilgal. Don't journey to Beersheba. 
He's saying those are places of false repentance. Those are places of false worship. That's what he talked about in the whole previous chapter. Don't go to your fake worship sites that you've designed in the way you like. Don't do things your way. Do things God's way. He ordained a way for Israel to worship. He ordained a house of worship. He ordained a sacrificial system. And they were taking that, and then they were saying, and we're also going to take a touch of these pagan gods and throw them in the temple as well and maybe do some of the weird sex offerings that they do. Like, we're just going to incorporate that a little bit into our church too. It's okay. It's kind of the way we do things. It's not the way God totally designed things, but we're going to just incorporate that and do it our way too. And we're going to call that worship. We're going to call those offerings repentance. And he's saying no. When the fire comes, it's either true repentance or it's not. Seek God and live. You can seek your way. You can seek the human way. Or you can seek God and live. True repentance, right? He's revealing what true repentance is. The next section, 8 through 9. The one who made the Pleiades and Orion. The one who made the constellations. It's like, just in case you guys forgot, Israel, God made the constellations. I mean, I could understand if we forgot this. Like, have you guys ever seen out in the night sky where the Starlink satellites go by? Have you guys ever seen that? Where you like, there's like this chain of, of, it looks like stars. And they're moving through the night sky. And I had this thought, like, somebody could literally create their own constellation. They could put up satellites, and if they did it at the right time and in the right order and they made the right shape, we could literally make our own constellations. It's like, oh yeah, it'd be kind of understandable for some human these days to say, oh, well, I mean, God made constellations. We can make constellations too. That's not that big of a deal. It's so easy for us. It's almost like we get more and more tempted with our technological advances to like forget what true strength looks like. God's correcting them with this. He's saying, no, 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 no. The one who made the Pleiades in Orion, the one who turns the dawn into darkness, who darkens day into night. Verse 9. He brings destruction on the strong. It's not the other way around. Human strength is shown for how, how weak it actually is when God's fire passes among the people. The one who actually made the constellations, the stars that are however many millions of light years away, or I don't even know the correct measurement scale, right? Like this is, God is so much stronger than us and even our Starlink satellites. Not to mention, even at the time of Israel, this was clearly tempting, like to forget that God is the one who made the constellations and who brings the water over the surface of the earth. True strength, right? True strength is going to be on display when God passes through the people. What about true justice? Verse 10 through 13. Oh, they hate the one who convicts the guilty at the city gate. They despise, this sentence just gets me. They despise the one who speaks with integrity. It's like they despise the one who just says something in honesty and humility and out of wisdom, and after he thought about it for a while, and it's truly what he thinks, it's truly what he means, he speaks with integrity, right? Like, backfill in your mind what it would be like for somebody to just speak something with integrity, and this says, no, they actually despise the one who speaks with integrity. One of the commentators that I read, he said, a resentment of the truth characterizes the unjust. So it's not just that they're indifferent about what's true, it's like, no, they actually despise the truth. They actually resent the truth. They despise the one who speaks with integrity. They're not just indifferent to this true justice, right? Those who participate in this corrupt justice system here, we see it in verse 11, they, they actually benefit financially from the injustice. They build their houses of cut stone, right? And they plant their vineyards and it says they're not actually going to get to live in those houses, they're not actually going to get to enjoy the fruits of the vineyard. We can be tempted to think sometimes that we look around in the world and we see injustice and it's like, man, why would God let that happen? 
Why would God let that person run their business that way and benefit so much financially? That corrupt person. Why would God let that corrupt judge or that corrupt government operate that way? Look around the world, right, and you see these things. Like, why would God let that happen? There is no injustice that we see, even still today, not to mention at this time of the Israelites, that will not be repaid. There's no injustice that will not be repaid by God. The true justice of God will come to the people. They won't live in the houses of cut stone. They won't drink from the vineyards. True justice will happen. That's another one that gets revealed when God passes among the people. It's like when God passes among the people, the injustices are just corrected. And then last we get to this section 14 through 15. It says, pursue good and not evil. Verse 15, hate evil, love the good. Kind of summarizes all of these first three, right? True repentance, true strength, true justice. All of it boils down. True good and true evil. When the fire comes among the people, right? When God passes among the people, it purifies. When we have a consuming fire that consumes the evil and the wicked and the injustice and the, the false repentance and the false strength and whatever human ideas we have, all of that is sifted out. All the evil, right, is sifted out. And whatever's good is left to remain. God, as he passes through, right, he corrects, he purifies the justice, the strength, the repentance. And all that's left is the good and evil. And what's interesting to think about with this is like, it doesn't change what was good and evil. When God passes among the people, it doesn't change what was good and evil the whole time. It just reveals it. Like when you take fire to like just raw gold ore or whatever it is, you don't change anything in that into gold. You just reveal what was gold the whole time. And so we can look at injustice and we can look at things that seem evil and we can look at things that seem like false repentance and we can say, man, how is that ever going to be repaid? Well, when God passes among the people, First, we at least need to believe it's revealed. And, and the banner under all of this, this whole first idea, the, the large swath of this whole chapter is just like the purifying of God's fire. It's like when God passes through his people, it's purifying. The good is left and the evil is consumed. So God's fire purifies. That's the first point. The other thing we see, I mentioned there's an element of finality to this. There's an element of finality to what's happening. And this is where we get this phrase, the day of the Lord. Verse 18, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Now this is a phrase that we see all throughout the Bible, the day of the Lord. And it's always used in some some sort of like reckoning. It's like the balances, the scales seem imbalanced and the day of the Lord is like a reckoning and a balancing of the scales. And so we see what you could think of as like smaller scale days of the Lord throughout history. Because you could read this text, right? And you could see what Amos is saying and see the kingdom of Israel and say, well, the day of the Lord he's talking about is the day that military forces come in and conquer Israel. And that's not entirely wrong. It's just that this also applies in a larger scale, right? The day of the Lord is also a concept that summarizes just the fact that God's redemptive history, right? Ever since the fall, Adam and Eve, they, they, they commit sin and they, the fall, right? And they're separated. Humans are separated from God. And all of this history is like a redemptive history back to this reunion of the relationship with God. And the day of the Lord is a way of saying like the ultimate day, like the history is on a crash course, all of redemptive history is on a crash course to the day of the Lord. The final reckoning, right? Why? Well, because God will not tolerate false worship. 
God cannot tolerate evil forever. Now, he could be slow to anger. Our God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth. He can, by his grace, give us time to repent, right? But he can't let it go forever. So that's why we see it seems, it it can seem so harsh to us to read verse 21 through 23. I hate, I despise your feasts. I can't stand the stench of your assemblies. Even if you offer me your burnt offerings, grain offerings, I will not accept them. I have no regard for your offerings, right? Take away your music from me. It's like, oh, that sounds so harsh, doesn't it? Well, we just have to know that the balance, the, the scales will be balanced. When he says, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord, it's kind of like saying, if you understand that you're under the fallen nature, right? And you long for the day of the Lord. You long for the day when the scales are finally balanced. Just be careful with that. He asks this haunting question in verse 18. What will the day of the Lord be for you? And he's condemning Israel, right, for their wickedness. And he says, for you, it will be darkness and not light. So we can ask ourselves that question, what what side of this are we on? What will the day of the Lord be for you? Because the thing we see in this text is at least that we can know that a day of the Lord is coming. A day of reckoning is coming. Like from this concept of seek the Lord and live or he will spread like fire, we see God spread through the people like a great reckoning is coming. Point number two, a great reckoning is coming. There is a finality to the moment that God fully passes among his people. The Israelites are being warned about this, and it's giving them a sense of seriousness and urgency for the state that they're in. And we learn the exact same lesson, the same exact principle. There is a seriousness and an urgency and an ultimate truth to what God is saying. There is a finality to God, God's judgment. Okay, third, cosmic justice. There's a cosmic justice going on. What do I mean when I say that? Okay, so we saw like justice and injustice of these wealthy people building their houses out of oppressing the poor, right? Well, that's like human to human justice. We also have to zoom out bigger scale and see that there's kind of a cosmic justice and injustice going on here. So we see verse 25, right? House of Israel, was it sacrifices and grain offerings you presented to me? But you have taken up Sakuth, your king, and Kaiwan, your star god, images you've made for yourselves. So this is essentially idol worship. They're worshiping idols. They're worshiping the works of their hands. Like we can think anything that we worship other than God is idolatry. If we worship ourselves, right, in the mirror, we worship our image, we worship our accomplishments, or we worship the person that we look up to, idol worship Here's what we have to know about idol worship. It's cosmically unjust. It's not just the wrong thing to do. It's actually an unjust thing to do. It's to give worship to anything other than God when it's God who deserves the worship. To give what belongs to God, right? Worship, glory, to anything other than God. We don't just see that as like, hey, that's just not a good idea. You know, I wouldn't recommend it. No, we say like, no, that's unjust. It's wrong. That's why this isn't harsh. Like what God is saying here, how how the idol worship, right? They're going to be exiled for the idol worship. He can't stand their feasts. He can't stand the stench of their assemblies. He can't stand the burnt offerings. It's like, it's false worship. It's giving to anything else what God deserves. It's idol worship. And what we see when this fire passes among the people is that, man, the idols will perish. And that's cosmic justice. That's like the removal of something getting worship when that worship is owed to God. We believe God is who he says he is. Like if you believe God is who he says he is, you have to believe idol worship is unjust. 
We see this, Leviticus 19.4. It says, Do not turn to idols or make cast images of gods for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. Sometimes we can read that and think, I am the Lord your God is just like his tag ending on things. Like, it's just like his stamp of, this is an important statement. No, he's saying, do not make idols or cast images of gods. I'm God. Not those. Not the things you built with your hands. Not your ideas. Not worshiping in your temples your way. Doing your own sacrifices. I am the Lord your God. That's why idol worship is bad. Because it's, it's giving something that, giving it to something other than God that God deserves. So God's fire comes and the idols perish. And so we see kind of this theme, right? We've, we've seen the true justice, true righteousness, true strength, true repentance even cosmic justice, right? Even kind of a, a, a true final balancing of the scales. And as we summarize all this, we summarize all this. Okay, what's it like when God's presence comes among the people? I love verse 24. It's almost like a gem hidden in here. So it's almost like you forgot that I read this earlier. Let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. I love the word let. Just let justice flow like water. Let righteousness flow like an unfailing stream. When God comes among his people, we can read this and be scared and be afraid and be like, man, I don't even know if this sounds good. No. When God comes among his people, it's pure justice and righteousness. This fire, right? This purifying fire. Pure justice and pure righteousness. In fact, it can be easy to forget and to think that this, a story like this, we read like God saying, seek the Lord and live or he will spread like fire. We can think that it's like God is the, the wizard up in the sky, right? Like sending the fire down with his hands. And God is, is detached, but he's just sending fire to like hurt people. That's not what this says. Seek the Lord and live or he will spread like fire. The fire is not something that God sends. The fire is God. It is God's presence among the people. Okay. So what, what, how does that change our life? How does understanding that, that that's actually, this is what happens, right? This is what happens when God passes among his people. How does this understanding of God change our life. Well, the first thing is we circle back all the way to the beginning, right? Verse one through three. Listen to the message. I'm about to sing a lament for you, house of Israel. I know, like we read a passage and study a passage like this and the hearts get heavy because it's like, man, how, where do I stand in this? I'm guilty of sin. Man, what will the day of the Lord be for me? I don't know. I feel like I don't, I feel like what I deserve is sometimes, is, you know, is like what I deserve is the judgment part of this. Like weep and mourn and lament for me. The first thing we can see is just mourn sin. Lament over sin. That is a healthy reaction. There is a time to stop and say, Man, I'm sad because of sin. Because I understand. I understand what it is. I understand sin as wickedness, as something that defiles, as something that, that hurts, that causes pain. Ultimately, I understand sin as something that is the cause of our separation from God. So first, how do we react? How do we react when we see that, that God, as the fire spreads among the people, and it has this sifting and it has this correcting. Like, first thing we do is we mourn and we lament. Just like God here. Like, God is using Amos to sing a lament song over virgin, virgin Israel. It's like, man, sing the lament song over all of us too. Because we've all sinned. Okay. Sin should be lamented. It causes death. It's unjust. It's wicked. Okay. Good. 
But next, seek God. That's the instruction that he gives twice in this text. It's like that's actually of all the stuff in this text that's about what's going to happen, there's like the one little glimpse of hope in this this sentence we see twice in verse 4 and verse 6. God says, seek me and live. Seek God. Seek the Lord and live. Seek God. You stop and you acknowledge sin and you see it for the wickedness that it is and you see it for the evil to, that it is. And what does it cause you to do? Man, look to the Lord. Seek the Lord. How's the, how's the primary way we seek the Lord? Because it can be easy for us to say, man, I'm like seeking for a sign and I, I'm looking over here for a sign and I'm, I'm searching my heart over here. And, uh, and I'm like, we're, it's like we can look in all these other places Guys, the first and foremost way we seek the Lord is right here. The first and foremost way right now in your life that you seek the Lord is through his word and through your prayer to God. Seek the Lord. It's the keynote of this whole passage. It's like the the key application of the whole passage. Don't skip over that. Seek the Lord. Pay attention. John talked about this last week. What's God doing in your life? Is he putting up a barrier? Is he putting up a a thorn hedge somewhere? Like, God's interacting with you in your life. Do you believe that? We read all this passage and we see all this stuff going on. Like, what is God doing in your life right now? Is he guiding you to make a different choice? Are you seeing sin in your own life or in someone else's life and thinking, man, maybe a change needs made? Are you reading his word are you studying his word? Are you praying to Jesus and asking for forgiveness and, and confessing your sin to each other and asking for forgiveness and seeking the Lord in those just humble, simple, daily ways? Seek the Lord. And then the second part of the sentence, live. This is the best part of this sermon. Do you guys know that this is Pentecost Sunday? So 50 days, like seven weeks plus the next day, after the resurrection is Pentecost. It's what we see in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 says this. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all gathered together in one place. Suddenly a sound like that of a, a violent rushing wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire. You guys hear that? Fire. Tongues like flames of fire. And what did they do? They separated and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues. Do you see what's going on here? Fire. Back in Amos, look at chapter, or look at verse, uh, verse 6. Here's the irony. He's talking about the false worship temples. What were they trying to do? What's their hope with this fire? It will consume everything with no one at Bethel to extinguish it. Here's the great irony. Once we start to understand God as a fire, our temptation is to say, I don't like that. we got to extinguish it. And he's saying, Bethel, like that's what they're trying to do. Oh, they're trying to extinguish the fire. They're unable. Guys, our hope, when when we learn this about God, God as a fire, as a consuming fire. Our hope is not to extinguish the fire. Our hope is Pentecost, right? The fire comes down, divides, and rests in each one of them. The way that we live, right? Seek the Lord and live. The way that we live. Like, that's not seek the Lord and, like, truly live and have a good life and, you know, live your best life. It's like, no. Seek the Lord and survive. The way that we do that is not on our own, but it's by Jesus. It's Christ in you. The only way the fire doesn't consume you, right, is is not by any works that you've done. It's by the works that Christ has already done for you on the cross. And it's by that being applied to you, right, And when you place your faith and your trust in Jesus as your Savior, and you say, Jesus, you paid a price that I owe, 
and I ask you for forgiveness. And you, you live your life this way. You truly place your faith and your trust in him. The spirit comes, right? Just like Pentecost, we see that image. And the fire comes down. And now instead of consuming you, the fire's in you. Church, that's our hope. The fire in you. Your greatest hope is the fire. It's not your greatest fear. I mean, you fear the Lord, right? You fear the Lord and you're protected by the Lord. Like, rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. We hide in God's fire. We are protected by God's fire. And think about the burning bush. Our hope is to be like the burning bush, right? Burning but not consumed. To have the fire, to have Christ in you, church, that's our hope. That's why we read a text like this. Like, our main response to this text is not sadness. There is mourning, all right, we understand the seriousness and we mourn, okay. But then our main response is what? It's hunger. So we see, like, we see this text is about how much we all need Jesus. How much we all need the grace of God. Because we can't do it on our own and because this is what we deserve and it creates a hunger in us. And so the Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? Because they will be filled. Church, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Seek the Lord and live. Your greatest hope is not for God's fire to be extinguished. It's to have it in you. So seek God and live. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for our church here to, to be a church who, who loves your word and who prays and that we would just continue learning from this book of Amos, God, about you and your eternal attributes, and your eternal characteristics, and that we would see it and we would tremble in a healthy way at your strength, that we would understand your justice, God, above our own, that we would understand your your righteousness. We would understand true repentance, God. What would, we would see what it means to, to seek you and live. So God, I pray that, that that'll be real for all of us and that we'll come back to you in your word daily and in community, confessing our sin, unafraid to confess our sin, Lord, because Jesus, we know that you've paid the price and that we would grow, grow in holiness, grow in righteousness. Those are good things. Those are things we want. Your justice and your righteousness, Lord, pour them out like streams for us. And God, use us. And God, protect us. Thank you that you are a consuming fire. And thank you that we have a way to not be consumed only by your grace, Jesus, not by our works. So thank you. Amen.